Hello everyone, my name is Tia Skytte and I'm from MDC and uh, this is our Tidbit platform uh, and for, for you who don't know it, it's, uh, it's our knowledge sharing platform uh, with short and sweet stories or, or trends from the maritime industry. And uh, this is uh, our Corona baby. Uh, this is from all of us to all of you in a time of uh, restrictions and uh, separation. Um, and you can go back on our journal uh, and see the past recordings we have and you can share it with all of your colleagues. So uh, please do that. Today, Tidbits is all about the seafarers and how they're doing in this exact moment. One and a half months ago, we had a, a webinar uh, with MDC where Lisa Loloma Fohol from uh, the University of Southern Denmark, she was talking about the psychological aspects of being a seafarer in a time of a, a, a pandemic. And uh, she was pointing out what to look after uh, with your colleagues uh, if they have uh, something to deal with. But this is uh, difficult for us being ashore. So actually, I think it was quite lucky that uh, only one month, month ago, I was uh, seeing in the Shipping Watch news that there was a report from the Seafarers Happiness Index that actually showed the, the the stage of the average mood of the, the seafarers right now. So me and my colleagues, we were contacting Stephen Jones, who is here today, and he will uh, he will present the, the numbers of the report. Because actually I'm very concerned about the seafarers and how they are they are feeling because we need to show them acknowledge for their for the jobs they're doing right now. And uh, we have to acknowledge that that being a seafarer and being a seafarer the industry is not at all the same as 20 years ago, because today we are we ha we are having our smartphones and we are connected digitally. So we also expect much more of each other, and we are not at all used to so long contracts. So even though I am uh, enjoying the nice weather in Denmark, I also send out the uh, karma and, and thoughts to the seafarers. And uh, today. I have the uh, broad noodles because that's uh, what really reminds me of uh, being at sea and uh, the night shifts and uh, also my homemade kombucha. So it's a strong combo and uh, cheers to everyone. Cheers. And uh, I think I'm ready to pass on the stage to you, Stephen. Uh, I can uh, start saying that he's uh, live from the UK and uh, he's the founder of the uh, Sea Paris Happiness Index. And I really hope that you will prepare some questions for him to answer and you can put them in the chat um, when we go along. So uh, enjoy very much and um, it's yours, Stephen. Thank you very much. Uh, a little bit earlier in the UK, so um, I'm sure that was tea and not whiskey you were drinking, but uh, we're a little bit before lunch here. It's a, an awful day outside, raining. I'm sat on the banks of the Mersey. On a good day from my office, I can see Anfield. On a bad day, unfortunately, I can see Goodison. So that gives you a little bit of an insight of where I am. Um, thank you ever so much for inviting me to talk about seafarers, seafarer happiness more particularly. So if we make a start on our presentation and we can hopefully talk through some of the aspects of life at sea today of why happiness is important despite the question mark. So, does seafarer happiness matter? A very fundamental question, just to set the scene, and so there's no debate, yes, it matters enormously. Soft skills make sense. Increasingly across so many industries, we're seeing that journey towards embracing how people feel, wellness, mental health, all these terms that come out, but actually scratching through all the surface through all the clutter, it's happiness that is fundamental to the way people perform. It's important in all relationships. And it's about asking questions and about asking answers. And that's really what the Seafarers Happiness Index has always been about. It's about trying to understand what life is at sea, empathizing with seafarers, and of trying to raise the flags 
of problems and also moving towards fixing them where possible. Hopefully many of you have heard of the Seafarers Happiness Index. It is a simple, a simple idea, a theory of asking seafarers how they feel. Are you happy? It's as simple as that. But as we dig into the answers, things become slightly more complicated. So in essence, just setting the scene of what we do on a quarterly basis, we ask seafarers how they feel and they tell us. We then score their happiness based one, very, very unhappy, 10, exceptionally happy. Um, and we pull that data together to, to see the peaks and troughs of how people feel. Um, it's not just about data, as we'll discuss. It's about a narrative, too. It's about seafarers opening themselves up and talking about the way they feels, feel. We're then able to pull that all together in a report, and we share it with industry. We share it with the likes of you. We tell the stories. We get them across. And hopefully, hopefully there'll be lots of questions. And it's another chance to really give seafarers a voice and a chance to explain how they feel about life today because listening is key to everything if we don't listen we obviously won't hear anything but we won't hear about problems and we won't understand what we need to do and throughout years decades centuries even it's often been a lot of talk about seafarers but often not much kind of real data or input about the realities at life of sea and those type of gaps they undermine everything we do, whether it's the work of the Mission to Seafarers, whether it's us all as professionals who care, whether it's our, our industry, whether it's our companies. Uh, if those are sure know too little, it's impossible for us to understand or to have empathy and really reflect the demands at sea as they are experienced by seafarers today. So what does happiness mean? Well, it means lots of different things to lots of different people. And that's possibly one of the challenges of the index. How do you take such a subjective issue and try to kind of flatline through it and um, understand what an individual is experiencing? It's very difficult, but if we didn't try, we would never achieve. So this is what this is all about. It's desperately trying to show that we care, that we understand that happy, satisfied, well-fed, fit and engaged seafarers, they're less likely to have accidents. They're less likely to come disaffected. They will perform better. They will be part of an industry that we can be rightly proud of, obviously, and we will discuss the COVID-19 issue later on in the presentation and certainly hopefully when you're asking questions. These are important issues. And if we don't address them, if we don't understand the challenges and we don't give a voice to the seafarers, we will never be able to fix things. So we asked 10 questions marked out of 10 about mental, physical health, diet, rest, workload, wages, interaction, connectivity, about the services they experience, about the relationships on board and at home. Seafarers answer anonymously. Hopefully every trip we try to encourage seafarers as often as possible to share what they're thinking um, and it enables us to start addressing some fundamentals. Originally this started as a, a, a kind of campaign within a company, a social media network aimed at seafarers called Crew2 that hopefully many of you have heard from and I was looking at the list of people who are watching this now and I was really very pleased to see that um, some people who are fundamental in the seafarers' happiness at its earliest inception. Sue Henny from KVH is online watching, and also Ben Bailey from the Mission. So originally we were part of Crew Two, but eventually we've now moved to be part of the Mission to Seafarers provisions. So that's really important. The journey this process has been on, but it started with trying to understand. Many of you hopefully will have seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What humans want and need in their lives and we thought well what about seafarers what do they need and want so we tried to kind of build our, our triangle our hierarchy of needs to to reflect what seafarers want yes the physiological the the food the drink good air to breathe um but then through the various layers up through the culture of seafaring their own esteem and where people want to position themselves as their careers um progress and also in seeing that, 
that's the positive, the upward trends, if you like. It's important to know what happens if people are pushed down, if they're not getting the things that they need and seeing this gradual decline in mental health and well-being. So happiness is a wonderful, fundamental measurement of how people are reacting in their situations. As I touched upon earlier, it's not just about data. The data is important. It's good and it gives you a good hook. It gives you something for the maritime press to get their teeth into. Oh, the happiness has declined. It's one point down. That's useful and it gives people benchmarking. And we'll talk about companies doing the benchmarking. But to me, the more telling and important insight is when seafarers open up and they tell us. They tell us about how they feel. They tell us about the things that are affecting them, what they are going through, what they're experiencing. And in doing that, combined with the data, then all of a sudden employers have an opportunity to see where people, where things are going wrong, where their people can be supported. The small chipping, chip, chipping away at what it is to be a seafarer and what life is. So, Let's talk about the index very briefly, what it is. We talk to seafarers and thousands of seafarers across every quarter, thankfully, step up and share what they feel with us. It varies month, uh, quarter to quarter about the waxing and waning of who tells us what. In the main, I would say bulk carriers, container ships, tankers, they do tend, to, as you would perhaps expect, to tell us the most. Deck crew, Deck officers tend to be more open than engineers. As a former deck officer myself, that probably tallies with my experience of engineers, but we wouldn't like to cast aspersions. Age groups, really, thankfully, we're in this kind of really good zone, 25 to 35, where people are starting to see perhaps that they are going to have a career at sea. So it's great that we do get the majority of seafarers respond to us in that kind of zone. The one area where we suffer, and again, reflective of industry, far too few females um, respond. And that is something that we need to work really hard on trying to encourage that engagement with female seafarers. Um, those female seafarers that do talk to us, there's a real kind of wide gap between their experiences from those who are having the absolute living their best life and best career and so pleased that they're at sea through to those that unfortunately are suffering from bullying and various other problems at sea. So really, we do need to hear from more female seafarers. And I know that's an issue that uh, many within the industry are trying to address. So every quarter, we, we pull the data together. We have a report. And here you can see the 10 different questions that we ask. And you can also see the latest data, which was the end of the first quarter, 2020. Uh, on average, the happiness level was down, and it seems to have been coming down over quite a number of the last few quarters. And you can check out all the reports, uh, more of the kind of analysis on our dedicated website, which is happyatsea.org. More of that later. Um, but these are the areas we cover and we can plot how people are feeling, how CIFA is experiencing the various elements that make up their life at sea. So if there's any questions on the data, then happy we can push on to that later. In quarter one, obviously, reflecting the terrible pandemic that's going on around the world, we really wanted to focus in on the COVID effect on seafarers. Early in the year, this first quarter, it was really telling that we were kind of seeing the first kind of seeds of what was going on, of the problems to come. And through that first three months of the year, there were definite causes concern. Tensions were starting to rise. People were starting to feel a little bit stuck, but unsure really of who they were going to fight with to get themselves home. And morale was starting to be impacted. And in the latter part of the quarter, we really could see the figures coming down. And these were the voice is of the seafarers in these past couple of weeks as I've started to go through the data, which we haven't calculated and analysed yet. But it feels like it's a dam about to break. The tensions, the frustrations, the annoyance are building. And it is my view that it's reaching a pivotal point. People stuck on ships, unsure of when, if, how they will get home. And conversely, we're also hearing a lot from seafarers stuck at home 
worrying about their profession? Do they have to start to look elsewhere for a job? And it's really starting to, to really have a terrible impact on seafarers. Um, the message from them is clear that port, flag states, their home nations, the transit destinations, even the airlines need to be considering more. And it's clear that we do have to work together to find the solutions, the right things. Um, early on in this process, I started to, to compare the responses we were getting from seafarers to being akin to the stages of grief. I don't know if many of you are aware of this kind of the, the seven points of, of how people deal with grief. And this was definitely what seafarers were experiencing when it looked like they may be trapped on ships. At first, utter shock. This can't be happening into the denial phase. Then there was anger. This can't be right. Someone has to act. And then we saw lots of crew, just, just get me off. I just need to get home. And depending on where they've been, whether they feel the answers are going to eventually plum, come, then there is some degree of acceptance or depression. And there's no sign in sight of any kind of solution to these problems. And unfortunately, too many are in that kind of position at the moment. But there's definitely this kind of heavy pall hanging over seafarers. Aside from the COVID issues, there are ever-present problems. And throughout, this was a kind of snapshot of the, the year just gone of the happiness index. Um, the, before COVID distracted everyone from the uh, low sulfur fuel debate, there was definite fears about criminalization sneaking back in. Loneliness, isolation are always perennial problems. The issue of shore leave, before people were staying on board because they weren't allowed off for, for the uh, virus. Again, another problem that constantly comes around, concerns about connectivity and engaging with their families, the cost of communication, the standard of quality of um, communication is always an issue, although I know some companies are working very hard in that space. Food, too much fried food, people feeling unhealthy, not getting the exercise that they want, and concerns about wages. So time and time again, these are the messages from seafarers out in the global fleet, fleet that these are the problems they're facing. So that's where we are. That's what we do. That's what we care about. We're focusing on trying to get the message live from seafarers. Um, so what I would ask of you is to engage with us, to read the reports, get a sense of what you feel, um, make suggestions to me or the team at the mission on how we can be affecting these. If you're a seafarer, please do share what your thoughts are. If you know seafarers, get them involved. And if you're working in a maritime industry, then engage with it. And more particularly, if you're a, mar um, a shipping company, we would love your people to be part of this. And a number of companies are getting more involved in benchmarking so we have the global fleet or particular vessel types and we're able to kind of tailor responses to gauge how their seafarers feel we've been very fortunate thousands of seafarers helping us many shipping companies the sponsorship of the ship owners p and i club and also wallum group ship management they're pivotal to this and so too the energy of the mission to seafarers who do so much to care for those working at sea uh, and to you two for taking the time to listen to this uh, you know we're really grateful and thank you for inviting me to talk so i'll hand back to tia now and hopefully there will be a few questions if i haven't put you all to sleep thank you great Stephen. first of all i i want to say that it's great that there are people like you a uh, Caring so much about the seafarers and making this kind of index, it's 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 really important. And um, I do see that there are questions coming in, but firstly, I have a question I would like uh, you to answer, and that is, how do you see that the companies <clears throat> that they are are they supporting uh, this index, and, and and what are they doing? Um, yeah, in the main, I mean, like any new ideas in the shipping industry, to <laughs> track is an issue and it does take time there's always an element of kind of mistrust or uncertainty and, and companies don't like to make problems for themselves you know that's always a, a very real issue for them 
there's an old phrase of uh, don't ask questions you don't want the answer to. But increasingly, we are finding shipping companies that can see the benefits of understanding how their seafarers feel. There are definite issues that we tease out every quarter. That can, there are opportunities to improve. There are small changes that can be made that will have a massive increase on happiness. And that, too, has a huge impact on performance and the, the ultimately safety and uh, efficiency all the all the things that we constantly crave as an industry they're there to be improved with a little bit of focus on seafarers and what they need and want yeah okay and i think it's quite related to one of the questions i've got from nana Tut, and she's asking you how do you think that the relation between sea and shore affects the seafarer's happiness? It's a very important pivotal point, and I'd, I would break it down into a couple of kind of levels. There's the culture of seafarer and what it is to be a seafarer, the pride you have. And unfortunately, what we've seen uh, is a bit of an erosion of that. And probably we've seen it more through this COVID time than anything before. The fact that we have to kind of beg for seafarers to be considered key workers when there's so much focus on truck drivers and people stocking the shelves in supermarkets, key workers though they all are and a wonderfully important job, but without the ships bringing the stuff in. So it's almost like there's a line beyond which people cannot see. I know it's called the horizon and we can't see over it, but um, we're not doing a very good job at maybe promoting that. So that has an impact, that's sure, you know, the pride that people feel as a seafarer, if no one recognizes them, then that's an impact. The other side of that equation would probably become in the shore management. Increasingly, fewer people in shore management have experience at sea. Now, that doesn't have to be a terrible thing. Lots of great people in the maritime industry, people I hugely respect, look up to, and have inspired me, haven't been to sea. But what they do is they all understand that, and they don't seek to impose their own views about what it is to be at sea. Um, mm -hmm. They learn from seafarers. They learn from those of us who have been to sea, and that makes it work. We have had very negative feedback from seafarers who get immensely frustrated dealing with management ashore if, if it looks like they don't understand what it is to be at sea. So, so those two kind of negatives, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that... It, it's it's quite important because that it's, it's it's so important that you have this index that they, they, they have the opportunity to to tell you how they're actually feeling because I do know that that some serious seafarers they are being denied telling actually the truth to yeah. the to the world so so they have to keep it inside themselves and I cannot imagine to to walk around with, with these thoughts uh, on board the vessels and they cannot they cannot stick true to themselves. So we thank you for for letting them a uh, giving their 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 uh, yeah their words. <laughs> okay, so there's another question. It's from uh, Ben Bailey, and he is saying, "Hi, Stephen. You have made the happiness index a valuable tool in telling seafarers stories. What's the benefit of companies to have a bespoke index? Is benchmarking important?" Yeah, I mean, as we kind of touched on there, I think it's a wonderful tool. I think it's really important. A, a company engaging with this sends out a really positive message to their own seafarers that they want to know, that they care about it, that they're investing in where you're at. Um, the relationship between the global seafaring population and us, it's a big kind of ask. There's a lot of disparate parts, a lot of moving parts in the industry, and we're just trying to give a snapshot. But what you do as a company, if you drill down into your own fleet, into your own seafarers, then you get a chance to fix your own problems. And if you fix your own problems, then you mm -hmm. have a competitive advantage over those that don't. So benchmarking, I think, can be a hugely important, beneficial part of that. And hopefully, what we have in the mission, myself and, and Ben and, and the people, the team that work in that, is an understanding of protecting the anonymity of not only the seafarers, but in making sure that we do support companies who are trying to do the right thing. So um, I think from a commercial perspective, it makes massive sense. 
Mm -hmm. But have you um, have you experienced companies that refuse to uh, to to let the seafarers um, uh, answer the the index? Um, well, everything is completely anonymous, and we we don't have any insight other than the kind of data that we collect. Um, it's it's one of those you know unknown unknowns. We we don't know the companies that don't allow them to talk, and we don't know the seafarers that we're not engaged with. I I suspect yes. I mean, we we all of us in shipping know that it's a very kind of layered industry and and for all of those companies you know many of them that are your members over there in Denmark and the companies that many of us deal day to day with are wonderful companies full of people who care passionately not just about the commercial aspects but they know that doing the right thing involves the people unfortunately below those levels as you kind of fall down and down then there are companies who who aren't good mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephen. There is a question now coming in from uh, Sue Henny. She is asking, outside of the pandemic, there are several areas that are challenging uh, for the crew. If we could, could only fix one issue, what would be the number one priority for the seafarers? One, wow. <laughs> Sue always with the tough questions. Um, when I was at sea myself, the experience I have talking to seafarers now, it's a sense of being connected. If they feel connected to home, if they feel connected with their colleagues on board, if they feel a positive connection with the company, then all else kind of falls into place. So I think the connections and relationships, if you like, so connections from being able to communicate with home, or being able to talk to people on board, to be able to raise issues as a respected professional with their company. These are, that is, is the one shining kind of light of all of this. If you have that, it feels like you have a chance with many of the other things as well. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, Rupo is also giving a, a question. He is asking, do you see any connection between the level of seafarers happiness and leadership at sea? Um, when I get all the answers in, they, they go through our happy at sea.org website, they fill in the questionnaire, and it eventually spills out a big Excel spreadsheet with the numbers, blah, blah, blah. And you can tell immediately the seafarer who isn't being led by people they respect, isn't being managed well, doesn't feel respected up the chain of management. Um, we get some quite robust seafaring language that refers to some of these interactions, but definitely poor leadership impacts happiness massively. Mm -hmm. You know, we all know it ourselves. You know, if the people we deal with seem like idiots, if they don't understand us, if they tell us to do stupid things, if they ask unfair things of us and don't think about us in the equation, then we're going to be unhappy. And it's no different on the ship, and it's no different in the office, and it's no different in our everyday lives interacting with people. So good leaders tend to, weirdly, work with happy people. Mm -hmm. so judge for yourself, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, just uh, a service info, it's one minute uh, to half past 12, and normally this concept is only a, a 30 minute. So uh, if people, they want to log out, they're very welcome. Uh, but I think we can continue a little bit more with some questions with you, Stephen, if it's okay with you. <laughs> Fire away. Because they, I, I have a, another comment on, on actually students is a question here because I saw on your slides before that um, the, the, the seafarers that are entering the, this index, it's not too much of the senior, senior officers that are, that are entering. Do you think that that some of the senior officers they are a, a little bit um, bothered with with a new initiative? A, do you have any idea about that or comment on that? I think there's um, there's a worrying kind of division in seafaring. There is the 
old uh, and I think probably we are, you know, gender driven in that there's a quite a macho kind of let's get the job done regardless. There doesn't seem to be that much kind of focus on happiness. And I think that was because people tended to just be happier, larger crews, more people to interact with, longer time ashore. The building blocks of it were fundamentally more kind of compelling uh, for a positive life at sea. As they've been withdrawn, some of the mindset, and it's not everyone, it really isn't everyone, you know, but the older seafarers tend to maybe not engage with the concepts. Mm -hmm. Soft skills are kind of tutted and rolled eyed about sometimes. Um, maybe we're not communicating the message of the positives. And hopefully, as we start to see improvements, as we start to focus on people and their happiness at sea, then hopefully those who maybe are dubious about its benefits can start to say, well, actually, things are better. Accidents, you know, improving. Fatigue, you know, people aren't as fatigued. People are getting the rest they need. Everything, it's a spiral around happiness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of the things I was um, looking a little bit into from your slides, where you put the... Some some uh, green and some uh, red mark the uh, lines. It showed that that some of the the bonus kind of things uh, like uh, food and interaction with crew and welfare uh, facilities when ashore ashore they were green. And of course, this is not a bonus. It has to be there. But some of the ones that were marked red was um, that they are not happy with the. Uh, the, the contact to the families and also the workload that they're having when they are on board and of course they're concerned about the, the, the their um, their pay their payments so they can pay their bills yep. those kind of uh, things they they were marked red and I think that that's a little bit concerning yeah I mean what, what we tend to find is that sometimes the data the numbers don't necessarily mesh with what the story of seafarers telling us because of course those seafarers that take the time to type are mm -hmm. doing it for a good reason and they tend to be far more engaged with what they're typing for a good reason they're they're more kind of disenfranchised the angry people we, we don't get many writing in length to tell us how wonderful things are some do don't get me wrong but mm -hmm. uh, yeah there's as i touched upon in, in one of the last slides there are perennial issues surrounding all of this um we try very, very hard that the index, that the reports that we push out are not just moaning. They come with real tangible performance deliverables associated with them. We want progress, and we won't get that by just turning into a sounding board for those that are un unhappy. We need to reflect that, and that's important. But that what what I try to do in going into the stories, into the data, is try to weave not only the narrative of what is going on, but of where the opportunities are to improve. And that's a massive part of it because I don't want to be doing this forever and never having had any positive impact because, quite frankly, that would be ridiculous and would be the worst wasted opportunity that any of us would have. So it is out finding the answers, helping companies, helping seafarers themselves, if that's a thing that they can do themselves, mm -hmm. uh, and turning it into, into positives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why it's so important to continue getting better and, and, and to, to actually know what, what they, are, they are feeling out there. Yeah. Okay, Stephen, two, two last questions uh, have come in. Um, one is from uh, Adam uh, Whittle. Uh, I hope it's uh, the right way to say it. He's saying, hi, Stephen. Are Super React crews consulted? The what, sorry? Uh, are Super, Super React crews consulted? Um, we do push it out to Super Yachts. We don't tend to get much response at the moment. And I think um, I'm probably speaking for Ben here. Sorry, Ben. Um, I think it's an area that we are going to be kind of more specifically looking at because as um, so Adam is one of our propeller club members in Liverpool. He's a, a wonderful guy involved in all kinds of maritime issues. Um, 
we, we think, as as I'm sure Adam would agree, super yachts are different. They want to be treated different. The life is very different. Everything changes. So I think it would probably be beneficial to have its own standalone look at the super yacht experience, if you like. Um, those that do respond at the moment, uh, and they are very few, but they do tend to be uh, happier than most of the others. Mm -hmm. And um, one last question and a comment from one of my uh, former colleagues. It's a female seafarer. It's uh, Emma Gronson. She's asking, how are you going to reach out to the female seafarers? Just took the survey myself, so now you have one more. Nice, Emma. Every journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Um, better people than me are struggling to find the answers of engaging in the whole women in maritime debate. And I think it would probably not be great for a middle-aged white man to be talking about the demands and needs of people in various sectors. So I don't know the answer. I hope we can find the answers. I guess from my perspective, it's about openness, it's about engagement and hopefully creating a, a viable, safe space for people to engage and talk and move things forward. I know there are so many efforts of so many great people looking at this. Um, and all I would say is I hope the Happiness Index makes an important part of their armory in trying to move these things forward. And I would love nothing more to, to see the kind of percentages of female seafarers, not just those that work in the maritime industry, obviously, but who share their views. And of course, you know, their experiences becoming more positive as well. We have the power to make life at sea better for everyone, regardless of gender. So uh, we need to do that. We need to listen to what seafarers today are telling us. We need to respond to that. And we need to make it a better, nicer, happier work environment, both on the ship and in the surrounding kind of infrastructure. So make seafarers feel welcome, feeling part of the bigger picture, what they're doing, being key workers, understanding the respect, and that each and every nation would collapse within a couple of days without ships coming in and bringing us the things that we need, want, and crave. And that's the fundamental. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we, this is part of that journey. Mm -hmm. I guess that uh, the 23 people that have signed up for this uh, short talk with, the, with us right now, they are really concerned about the seafarers and they do acknowledge their work out there, but let's just continue spread the word and uh, give them um, all the all the acknowledgement they, they need for the, the job they're doing. Yeah. Stephen, it's almost 10 minutes past now, so I think we should close it down now, but I will send a message to all of the participants afterwards, um, and I can send your LinkedIn profile so they can uh, link, uh, catch up with you. And um, it, I'm very happy that you have made this index uh, so that the they, that the people they can also answer anonymous. It's it's very important. So let's spread the word. And uh, lastly, I would like people to uh, enter the poll. I've just uh, put put it up right now. It's uh, we would like to know if if you like the tip we're serving you. So it's uh, just a sympathetic uh, poll for you. Um, from me, I would like to say thank you so much, Stephen. It's uh, appreciated your your, your time here and uh, your work. I think if I can just wrap up, uh, someone, Michael, has sent a thing saying you'll never walk alone, which is great from a Liverpool perspective. But actually, I think that sums everything up absolutely perfectly, that seafarers shouldn't feel that they're alone and that we're all in this together. So I think that seems to be a very apt way of wrapping it up and a, a real pleasure to be part of it. And thank you for inviting me. And thank you to all of you who've uh, watched and been part and hopefully stay part of the debate and we can uh, hopefully make progress together. So thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, have a great day. Bye. Bye.